Hello people, welcome to another episode with Supreme Decisions. And today, I want to clear up a little something because a lot of times you hear me often say, whenever you're filing a federal lawsuit against a police officer, you do it in their personal capacity. Why? Because once they violate or do something outside the guidelines of the Constitution, of the department policy, or even, hell, just... A lot of times they're breaking state ordinances. Once they do that, they are no longer police officer Johnson. They are Dennis Johnson or whoever, right? And I've given you one of the case laws that I actually use for this in Monroe v. Pape. And the context of it is when you're looking at it, it's again, one of those, let's go a little deeper type conversations. Because there are a lot of times where we're watching shows or we're watching things that have happened, such as the Breonna Taylor case. And one of the things they're pushing to stop the federal lawsuit against the city as well as the police officer is to get a conviction because as you know they use your conviction against you now i often tell people whenever you're going to redo because that's exactly what it is you're redoing your case after a conviction there are certain things that you do and an appeal is not necessarily always the way to go but it is a start because a lot of times you have to start from scratch and giving you context, I'm gonna do that real quick with Dombrowski v. Pfizer, 380 US 479, and it's a 1965 case. So just understand, it's been here for a minute. But an appeal is not always a satisfactory remedy. The court itself has recognized that a citizen's rights may have seriously been violated, even if he is not ultimately convicted. Now, you often see the charges have been dropped in cases where people have went on to sue the police department. Just because they're dropped does not mean the case is over, does not mean everything is satisfied, and it does not mean that you don't, you no longer have a remedy just because the case has been dropped. So, one of the things we can go into is what a lot of times they're referred to as a Bivens Act violation because it's Bivens versus six unknown agents of the Federal Bureau of, of Narcotics. And it's a 1971 case, 43 U.S. 388. If a person or of two or more conspire for the purpose of impeding, hindering, obstructing, or defeating in any manner, the due course of justice in any state or territory with the intent to deny any citizen the equal protection of the laws or to injure him or his property for unlawfully enforcing or attempting to enforce the right of the person or class of person to equal person expect ju except judges. Now, I just said a whole bunch to say nothing for the most part other than the fact that if you're looking at multiple people, one of the things that you've heard me use is actors in concert. One of the terms that they use is conspiracy. These are also federal violations. Now, here's where we get into the why I say what I'm saying now. The elaboration on it. And it's nationwide amusement Inc. versus Natton, D.C., Louisiana, 325, and it's a 1971 case. Any plaintiff who alleges deprivation of federal rights by reason of action under color of law can maintain action under this subsection, civil rights. That's where I tell you to file your case at. Why? Because when you're looking at the constructs of 1983 case or the conspiracy cases or the violation 
is a federal violation of a civil right. Regardless of the undertones or the context of how you've been given civil rights violations, it does not necessarily mean an undertone of any type of discrimination other than the fact you were denied equal protection of the law. That's it. Now, and that you can prove that you were denied this equal protection, which is generally the easiest part of the whole aspect. But getting the evidence is the hard part. Embler v. Pochman, and it's a 1976 case, liability and damage for unconstitutional or otherwise illegal conduct has the very desirable effect for deterring such conduct. This is the purpose for the lawsuit. Indeed, this was precisely the proportion under which 42 USC 1983 was enacted. Judges may be punished criminally for willfully deprivation of constitutional rights on the strength of 18 USC section 242. And that is also civil rights. Now, a lot of times we're looking for why something can be done why it can't be done. And we also look for explanations of this wild shit that I say, but it's understanding the context because everything that I'm doing has a foothold. It has a actual bearing. It has substance because it's tangible. It's something you can touch. Why? Because it's something that is not my words. It is something I'm giving to you in a more condensed form. Why? Because now I'm spoon feeding you. I'm making sure you get this meal, but you're not eating too much the way it hurts your stomach. And here's where a lot of folks want to get into the constructs of the qualified immunity. How can we get around it? What is it? Even a Supreme Court decision, I guess if you can call that, is coming shortly on this. But under um, Bunch v. Barrett, Barnett, Employees of a city or state are not immune from suit under the statutes relating to civil rights for deprivation of rights on the grounds that their officials were acting in the scope of their responsibilities or performing a discretionary act. These are the things where I constantly talk about officer discretion. Bunch v. Barnett clearly states they are not immune from suit even when they're acting within the scope of their responsibilities of performing a discretionary act because officer discretions mean they make a decision. It's their choice to perform a willful act or act out of ignorance. You're going to follow law or you're going to enforce policy. The choice is yours. So is the liability. Now, here's where it gets a little tricky. And it's Thorn v. Jenkins, and it's a 1974 case. The reason why I say it's tricky is because the only elements would need to be present in order to establish claim for damages under the Civil Rights Act are that defendants have deprived plaintiff of a constitutional right and the defendant's conduct was under color of state law. When you're handed a citation, it has a number on it. That's the state law because remember the traffic violation itself is not a crime they can only punish you for something that is a crime because of the selective incorporation act so any violation that is done where you cannot confront someone or someone was not injured they are then liable for that action. Not my words, it's in these cases that I'm giving you right now. But I'm gonna end tonight with one more. That's two, but anyway. Fisher v. Pace, and it's a 1949 case. That will make this case 60 years old. The reason why I generally don't use cases that old is because we have decisions that are generally being handed down that reinforce the baseline cases. 
and this itself is not a baseline case. However, it goes into the constructs of the baseline case for this. Now, when the responsibilities of a lawmaker, prosecutor, judge, jury, and disciplinary are thrust upon a judge, he is obviously incapable of holding the scales of justice perfectly fair and true, which is why when you're going through and a judge allows the continuation of a constitutional violation that is blatant or a flagrant act, or even in our case, I use the word showing bias. These are things that are also in the American Bar Association. They're also codified in every state's organic code. If these things are present during a trial, during a case, in any effect other than the preliminary hearing, the grand jury hearings, everything else is fair game because that's why every challenge is done with purpose. That's why they have to follow precedent, but you also have to be able to present it in a manner which allows them to, as I tell everyone, allows them to cover their own ass because no one is going to take a lawsuit for anybody else. So that's what we have today. Just understanding why I'm giving it to you the way I'm giving it to you and why it is what it is for right now. So don't forget, join the channel in the description. It's literally a join button. Hit the button, man. Join. It's four tiers. Pick a tier. Let's get going with this thing. T-shirts. Pre-order. They're also in the description. Let's go. Go to the community section. Check it out. Tell me your size. Let's go. And lastly, share the videos. Because as you know, good information is not being shared very well nowadays. So we need something that's going to be substantial for all of us. And Supreme 